challenging to report. It's becoming very challenging to report for all kinds of reasons. But I mean, it's also uh, war is never an easy thing to talk about. At least I don't. I I've never found it easy. But you know, in every other respect, I'm extremely well. And can I just say, um, I'm very grateful to all those people who were worrying about the fact that I was struggling to find baby milk. My fa- my my <laughs> wife and I, but we did sort it out. We've got plenty now. And we're well stopped. So thank you for your kind words if you're all following, but that problem is resolved. All right. And Gonzalo Lira, first off, uh, thank you for joining us. It's always a pleasure to have you on the uh, on the live stream. And how are you, my friend? How are you doing? I'm doing fine. And once again, it's a pleasure to be on with you both. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging because as I've said repeatedly, uh, being in this situation is I once incredibly tedious and boring Mm. and terrifying at the same time, Mm. you know, because you're always a little bit stressed out and I'm Mm. in the center of Kharkov. I've had some issues with uh, potentially extremist people in the, um, uh, in the security forces of the current regime here in Ukraine who don't take kindly to some of the things I've said. Uh, And I've only ever tried to be as realistic and and commonsensical as possible. Mm -hmm. But that is in short supply around Mm -hmm. the world, I would say. Mm -hmm. And I'm in in the middle of Kharkov as it is being surrounded by the Russian army. And uh, every day I can say that the the sounds of shelling are getting closer, Mm -hmm. uh, which to me indicates that the Russians are tightening their noose around the city and um and yeah so you know let's dive into it wherever you guys want to start and i'll tell you all that i know well let's let's go into it right away alexander gonzalo um the the topic of this live stream is the fourth negotiations that are taking place so if you guys want to launch uh launch it from there from the negotiations we can start from there or if you guys want to give just a quick update as to how you see things unfolding whether it's from uh geopolitical economic or on the ground uh, whatever you know from that standpoint as well but right before we start i just want to make one or two real quick announcements first of all hello to everybody watching us on odyssey rumble and uh and locals as well as youtube welcome everybody wherever you are in the world uh thank you to our moderators as well a big big thank you to our Mm. moderators uh you guys uh, are the best. And mm. uh, we are going to be doing a hard stop in about an hour and a half. So mm. whatever questions uh, that are thrown our way, whether they're from our locals community or from uh, YouTube or Super Chats or Rumble, Odyssey, we will collect them all together again. And we will have a dedicated show as we are doing now uh, pretty much on a regular basis. We'll have a dedicated Q&A mm. show where we, where we will answer all of those questions. So we will do a hard stop in about an hour and a half. Um, Alexander, Gonzalo, the floor is yours. Start from uh, wherever you guys would like to start from. There, there's well, a lot of uh, news to get to. Yeah, I mean, there's. Uh, let's just start with the negotiations because, I mean, I did a program about this yesterday, but I think one important thing to clarify at the moment is that we have negotiations, but that doesn't mean we're anywhere close to any sort of breakthrough. I think that, some things have happened which suggest that the, the you know the tilt in the negotiations is changing we had the israeli prime minister prime minister bennett who apparently allegedly told zelensky look you've got to sort out you've got, you've got to be realistic you've got to come and accept russian the, the russian conditions because sooner or later you're going to have be forced to so you might as well start negotiating seriously about that now now that's been denied by the um, israelis it's been denied by the ukrainians officially it's all over the israeli media and i I, Mm. i'm sure that bennett did indeed tell zelensky precisely that and maybe the indication that there's been some movement over the last couple of days is that we've now learned that the negotiations which are the negotiations which have been going on for several weeks it's this group of negotiators from ukraine including the representative with the baseball cap and from ukraine very strange looking people but anyway i i just mentioned that but that that negotiation with the russians has been ongoing and lavrov when he met the ukrainian foreign minister kuleba made it absolutely clear in the press conference and apparently to Kaleba's face that that is the only venue for negotiations that the Russians are prepared to work with. They're not prepared to engage in any other parallel negotiation tracks. And 
from what I've been able to understand is that at the moment, the major focus in, in these negotiations and one of the signs that something is happening is that they've broken up into working groups. So there's people working out agreements on working groups. The major thing, the key point is humanitarian college corridors, local ceasefires to evacuate civilians from some of the key cities. And we've discussed in previous programs, all three of us, the way in which this very much resembles the strategy the Russians followed in Syria. And I noticed yesterday, or it might have been the day before yesterday, in the London Times, which, by the way, is the only major mainstream legacy media outlet in Britain that sometimes reports these kind of things. And there was a Ukrainian official who actually also said that the Russians appear to be following the Syria Aleppo uh, uh, process. So mm. some work towards getting some kind of humanitarian corridor sorted out, some kind of sea, uh, 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 local ceasefires, the eventual objective being to decant Ukrainian forces from all of these cities and to try to resolve the situation in them peacefully. That's the Russian objective, I am sure of it. But I was also reading today, and I think it was in the Financial Times, that the Ukrainians are gradually moving towards some kind of, um, slowly moving towards the Russian position on two of the issues that the Russians have flagged. One is demilitarization, the other is neutrality. We are very far from agreement on either of those points, but at least there's some sort of movement in that direction. I think that was in the Financial Times. Where there is no movement at all is on recognising Crimea and Donbass, but you know that's probably the trickiest part of the negotiations uh, going forward. So th th there's some sort of glacial movement on some of the political issues on the humanitarian and ceasefire issues, it might happen more quickly. We shall see. The other thing is that the Ukrainians are again trying to set up some kind of summit meeting between Zelensky and Putin. I gather that the Russians are very cool on that idea. They don't want a meeting between Zelensky and Putin without some documents to sign, some real substantive documents to sign specifically on the political issues. And I think they'd be very reluctant to have a meeting with Zelensky, which could just be used for grandstanding. So that's what I understand is the position in the negotiations. Some glacial movement are, are, are on some of the political issues, some perhaps more substantive movement on local ceasefires and humanitarian corridors. I think being realistic about it, this is going to take a long time before we see any real substantive breakthroughs. And, you know, when I say a long time, I'm not going to say how long. It could be days, it could be weeks, I think more likely weeks than days. Yeah, um, I, everything that you've said, Alexander, is exactly what I have heard, though my interpretation uh, is, is not, I'm, I'm not taking any of this at face value, to tell you no. the truth. Because uh, the whole point of humanitarian corridors is, of course, to evacuate civilians, but that's not the priority for the Russians. Their priority as far as humanitarian corridors are concerned. And the reason that Ukrainian forces, Zelensky regime forces, have blocked these humanitarian corridors yeah. is because they allow soldiers to take off their uniform, to put down their weapon, and slip away with the civilians. Yeah. And, and that is the reason that the uh, Zelensky regime has been so adamantly against the humanitarian corridors. They keep insisting that the Russians only want to make corridors from uh, the, the areas of conflict towards Russia or Belarus. Mm. This is not accurate. No. The Russians consistently offer escape routes for civilians and potentially fighters to Russia, to Belarus, and to the west of Ukraine and to yeah. the center of Ukraine wherever mm -hmm. the, the uh, conflict is. So this is a Russian tactic. And of course, uh, I did a video about this a few days ago. Um, the, the Russians have no interest whatsoever in hurting mm -hmm. people on these humanitarian corridors, because if they hurt mm -hmm. people, if they start shelling these humanitarian corridors, what will happen is that people will be frightened of mm -hmm. using them and won't use them. And of course, the Russians want people to use them to get rid mm -hmm. of the civilians 
in the sense of evacuating them from a, from a conflict area and therefore depriving the Zelensky regime of the PR mm -hmm. value of dead civilians. And also, of course, the, the primary objective is to uh, have soldiers begin to desert, which has always been a problem in every uh, conflict. Now, mm. my thinking is that the, 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 the working groups are focusing on the humanitarian mm. uh, corridors, but I think that the Russians have no intention whatsoever of coming to any sort of agreement with these negotiations, because I think that they have mm. made up their minds that their yeah. ultimate goal is complete control of Ukraine. And uh, th from their point of view, negotiations are great because they can work out these humanitarian corridors and it mm. makes them look as if they are doing something to mm. end the hostilities, but they're not going to stop. I mean, even if Zelensky were to come at them and say, yes, you know, you can have everything you want in these major points, the Russians would hem and haw and because they want regime mm. change. They want mm. to get rid of the entire Zelensky regime. Mm. And uh, politically for Putin, he can't come to an agreement with the Zelensky regime mm. because it would look like a loss. And here's the mm. other fact that in the West, they are not mm. reporting uh, and they're lying to themselves and to, and to everybody else, which is the Russians are winning. They are clearly mm. and decisively winning. And to claim mm. that they're not is just, you're on a different planet. I'm here in Kharkov. I hear them getting closer every day. The news yeah. is tightening in Kharkov every day. And you see this when you look at the maps of the other areas of, of, of great conflict, uh, Mariupol, also yeah. the uh, Eastern army, uh, Ukrainian army that has been yeah. essentially captured because yeah. it's not clear at this time whether the Russians truly have them completely surrounded in the yeah. East. But what is known is that the roughly 50 to 60,000 strong army of Ukraine that is in Eastern Ukraine right now, near the contact line with the Donbass, they can't retreat because they mm. don't have the resupply. They don't have the, mm. the gasoline mm. to move. And so they're kind of stuck and they're certainly not gonna get any reinforcements. And mm. what seems to me to be happening is that mm. The Russians have a coordinated offense where they have surrounded several nuclei of Zelensky regime forces, mm -hmm. but the Zelensky regime forces do not have any kind of coordinated defense. It mm -hmm. seems very clear and you know, you should bring on Scott Ritter because he would be the man who would really be able to, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to make clarity out of this. It seems that the various Zelensky regime units are isolated and yeah. essentially fending for themselves. Yes. And um, and so I think that the notion that the Russians are losing mm. is wishful thinking on the part of many people in the West. Yeah. And also, I think it's a way to set up a false flag, because mm. I do believe with all the noise that has been coming out of Washington and Europe mm. about the, the you know chemical weapons and how the Russians are going to mm. capture the material in the bio labs and then mm. use them against the Ukrainians, which of course would prove that those bio labs had biological weapons, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but anyway, it seems to me that the West is sort of like priming the pump for some sort of uh, false flag operation and say, see, the Russians were losing. And so that's why they, they went for these mm. desperate means and thereby opening the door to NATO involvement in mm -hmm. this conflict. Yes. Uh, because if you're looking at the facts on the ground, I, I don't quite understand how people think that they are losing when they yeah. are surrounding everything that's worth surrounding and the mm -hmm. stuff that they are ignoring, like the center of the country. Well, the center of Ukraine doesn't have much except mm -hmm. a lot of cows and grain, you know, and so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm uh, um, it, it seems the propaganda of of Russia losing creates the conditions for a false flag by the West that can be easily blamed on Russia at this time. Yes. That seems to be the case. Gonzalo, sorry. G Gonzalo, can I just say, I, I as a masterly discussion, it is very difficult from London to get a clear picture of what's going on on the ground. But to the extent that I can get it, and obviously I have to go to a variety of sources. I'm sorry, my dogs are barking rather loudly. But to the extent that I can get it from any sources, it appears it is completely corroborating exactly what you are saying. 
that the Ukrainian forces in eastern Ukraine are now essentially broken up into packets or parcels, that they're mm -hmm. surrounded, and that they're finding it extremely difficult to coordinate, and that they're no longer able to engage in any kind of maneuvers or offensive operations. And that yeah. in the most difficult place, which is Mariupol, apparently, mm -hmm. again, as you rightly say, they're sort of the Russians are gradually steadily edging ever closer to the center of the city. Uh, and I, I, I've heard that, you know, it'll be days r before it finally it finally falls. And of course, Mariupol yeah. is an important place because apparently I, I mean, I'm not a military person, but apparently it's something mm. of a hinge in the uh, in, in the battlefield. Can I just talk about this business about, you know, biological chemical attacks and all this? Because it's absolutely clear to me here that there is a split between the State Department, which has been very heavily promoting all of these stories and which is clearly taking the initiative and taking an extremely hard line against the Russians on almost every topic. They're the people who come up with all of the various sanctions mm. ideas who were mm. floated. I think I personally think that that crazy MiG-29 idea from Poland uh, was... Yeah. Yeah. basically hatch that that's my own personal view anyway this, the, they the the state department seems to be taking these very hard line positions the pentagon is spending its time shooting them down like it's yes. they've shot yes. down the mig 29 idea for example yes. and yes. then over the weekend and again i've had to i've read it's, it's i've been reading so many things in so many places mm. i don't remember where i read it but i read that the pentagon has actually said that they see no evidence of any preparation from any party, including the Russians, for any kind of biochemical incident in yeah. Ukraine. So I yeah. think the reason the Pentagon is saying that is because they figured out exactly, Gonzalo, what you're saying, which is that any attempt to stage an incident of this kind is clearly an attempt to put pressure on the Pentagon to, you know, declare no-fly zones, intervene yeah. in some way, and they yeah. don't want to do that. They're absolutely adamantly against this. And, of course, they've opened up the deconfliction hotline, so they're mm. talking. This is a thing people don't perhaps realise. The US military is talking with the Russian military in Ukraine constantly. There is yeah. constant movement backward and forward messages, communications, that that sort of thing going on. So the, I, I, mean, I, I find myself some, somewhat stunned to be saying this, but the Pentagon is acting as a tremendous sheet anchor of sanity in this yeah. crazy situation. That, that, yeah. That's how it looks to me. <laughs> That, that I would agree with you completely, and I think that must what must have spooked the Pentagon especially was the uh, cruise missile attack on on the um, on the NATO training center in uh, in western Ukraine. It's a town just uh, west of Lviv, uh, about uh, twenty I think about twenty miles from the border with Poland, and uh, it, it's it's a place where NATO had previously had uh, um, uh, teachers military uh, of course teaching uh, uh, NATO tactics to Ukrainian armed forces before this present conflict. And it was the place where a great many of the um, mercenaries or, or you know, volunteer, military volunteers, call them what you will, who had gone to Ukraine, that's, that was their staging area. And uh, the word is that uh, they were hit with 30 cruise missiles in one go, and the entire place was lit up. And the, the, the number of dead that the Ukrainians admitted to, they admitted to 35 dead, 135 uh, wounded. And the Russians said, no, 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 it's closer to 200. And slowly the Ukrainian number is starting to creep up towards that 200 that the Russians are claiming. And by the way, how did the Russians know that it was 200? And that, that probably means that the Russians have exceptionally good intel within the um, Ukrainian armed forces, but that's for another conversation. The point here, I think that that attack must have spooked the Pentagon very badly because the the Ukrainians didn't see it coming and nobody saw it coming. And it just happened. It just leveled the whole place. The name slips my mind. Um, if if uh, Alex, you can find the name of the uh, of the place. But I think that we all know what I'm talking about. Yar Yarov Yarovsky. Uh, yeah, Yarovsky. Yarovif. Yeah. Yarovif or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yarovsky, and actually, like I passed that. 
Yeah, I passed that town. Uh, I've mentioned before in other opportunities that I uh, rode my motorcycle across all of Ukraine from the Polish border um, and uh, right there, you know, all the way, you know, to Lviv and, and on to Kiev and all the rest of it. And, and so I passed that town. It's right next door to Poland. And so I think it must have scared the Pentagon something badly. You know, the, the thought that potentially one of these cruise missiles might have fallen into Poland and God knows what the political implications of that would be. Uh, and also it scared off all of these um, uh, military volunteers, if you want to call them that, because a lot of them were supposed to be going to um, Ukraine to join in the fight. And the Russians said very clearly that uh, any weapons coming from the West, any soldiers coming from the West would be considered uh, fair game. They said that, I think, on Friday, the, the, uh, it wasn't Peskov. It was uh, uh, a spokesperson for the Ministry of Defense of Russia. And they said that on Friday, on, on Sunday, Sunday bright and early in the morning, they are before dawn, they are leveling that whole staging area. Uh, and obviously making it clear that they are not focused on Western Ukraine yet, but they can do whatever they want in Western Ukraine. And there isn't anything that anybody can do about it, either the Ukrainian armed forces or NATO. And I think that that in combination is just scaring off the Pentagon and they want no part of this. I, I think that the Pentagon is realistic and, and realizing the, the things that ought to be obvious to any thinking person. Number one, the Russians have their military right there, okay? And they still have held back some of their best men, their best pilots, their best planes, their best tanks. They still have plenty of gas in the tank, as it were. Uh, and they're right in their doorstep. And number two, th for them, it's existential. They are going to win this no matter what, no matter what it takes. They are not going to, because it's not like Afghanistan. It's not like some foreign adventure. This is right there in their doorstep. And I think that the people at the Pentagon like you correctly said, Alexander, are putting the brakes on any kind of insanity coming out of the State Department. Yeah, the, the town is uh, Yavoriv. Yeah, I'm seeing from the yeah, chat. Okay, yeah, so that's the town. Yeah. Um, yeah. A, a couple of quick comments. Um, the other thing that uh, you uh, you left out, uh, Gonzalo, is that uh, Stoltenberg um, <laughs> oh, made comments a... saying that oh, if the Russians, if guy. the Russians. Uh, dare to dare to touch one bullet, one gun of uh, NATO property, then it is uh, going to lead to an Article Five incident. And what what was the Russians' response? They took out this training facility. So, <laughs> exactly. it, it, in a way, they kind of called Stoltenberg's uh, bluff there. Yeah. Um, a couple of other things, real quick. Uh, maybe a question to both of you guys: If Putin were to take that meeting with Zelensky. Doesn't that legitimize Zelensky and his shenanigans all this all this time? I mean, in a way, it would be yeah. a diplomatic loss for Russia. So he really yes. can't take that meeting with Zelensky yeah, until they exactly. have something concrete in place because it, it kind of legitimizes everything that uh, Zelensky has been saying the past two weeks. And it also provides the uh, the U.S. with a talking point, the, the collective West, yeah. let's say, it, it it provides them with that talking point that uh, Wendy Sherman was was uh, was discussing, I believe, like two, three days ago, where she said that Putin is starting to come around because the Russian military is uh, losing so badly. So it kind of uh, supports <laughs> yeah. that talking point and they'll be able to spin yeah. it in a way that will be OK, because Russia was losing so badly. It actually forced Putin to come to the negotiating table with Zelensky. So, I mean. What I want to say is that there's really not much choice for Russia or for Putin to to meet with Zelensky either way, because it'll be seen as a diplomatic and a strategic loss. I mean, what do you guys think about mm. that? And then I think we should also talk about uh, the incident with uh, China and Jake Sullivan uh, pushing out over the weekend that Russia is oh, yeah. seeking aid from China. And we've gotten very strong rebuttals from both uh, China and Russia. Well, can, can I just say a few things? Uh, uh, a few things here. Can I just go back though to a point that Gonzalo made before, which was about what the Russian objectives are. Um, the Scholz and Macron had a conversation with Putin just a few days ago, about mm. two days ago, and mm. um, afterwards, 
the French were putting out information which is exactly in line with what you said, Gonzalo, that they see that the Russians remain completely implacable, that they're not interested in the kind of ceasefire that the Western powers are trying to engineer. And uh, the French were putting it out that uh, the ultimate objective is the whole of Ukraine. That's yeah. what the French are saying. I mean, I don't know whether it's true or not, yeah. but that, that was what was all over the media here in Britain. I, mm. I cannot overstate how dismayed the media in Britain was after this missile strike in Western Ukraine. I, I, oh, really? I, you know, it, it really, it, it was, you know, the big news. There was serious alarm about this here in London. You could, you could sense this if you read the newspapers properly, and mm -hmm. so much so that I do indeed wonder what it was exactly which happened. I think that we're probably going to discover at some point, maybe in a year or two, that there's a lot more to this incident than we know. And that mm -hmm. I, I, I don't want to say too much because obviously we're on a particular platform. But I did notice that there was a rushed uh, statement that no NATO personnel were involved. Mm. Oh, take no, that, that, I, I have, take no, that as I have you no doubt. It. Yeah, I, personally, uh, uh, you gentlemen are far more judicious than I am. And you know that I'm willing to speculate uh, freely yeah. and randomly and often yeah. stupidly. Yeah. But I would venture yeah. to guess that the uh, that NATO had some people there, and mm -hmm. and that NATO might have lost some people, and yeah. and of course, you know they, they can't admit to having NATO people there yeah. Uh, yeah. for obvious political reasons, and because yeah. it would prove, of course, the Russians' point. And so, yeah, yeah I, I think that in a few years, when yeah. once this is all over, one way or the other, and yeah. and frankly, I I only see it ending one way, which is yes. complete Russian victory, because they're yes. they're there. <laughs> They're like three quarters of the way there. So, so well, indeed, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, and, and so I, 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 I'm positive that there were NATO people. And I think also it must have scared them um, because of the decisiveness, because people in the West are very used to bluster and talk, but little action and certainly not that kind of decisive action, uh, surprising and seemingly spontaneous action that Putin seems to be a real master of. I mean, if we go back two weeks, the invasion of itself, I freely admit, I never thought that an invasion would happen. But that decisiveness and, and the going for brokenness, if that's an adjective, of how the Russians went about the invasion, you know, that, that shocks people. And I think that this attack uh, shocked a lot of people, a lot of military people. And that, that surprise from the military people must have been translated to the uh, journalists that you read. Uh, absolutely. And can I, can I say that in some ways, the very fact that there was this shock does beg a lot of questions because, of course, the Russians have been launching attacks on air bases and airfields and base, military bases all over Ukraine. Why mm. would there be so much particular shock about an an attack on this particular base all right it's very close to the polish border but the russians have never said that they were going to attack that they were going to limit their attacks to one part of ukraine as opposed to another so why was there the shock and why was the casualty rate so high i think that there must have been there's as i said there's a story here that we don't know and of course oh, yeah. it may be that they're not people nato people exactly at this air base but of course you can have all kinds of contractors and subcontractors and sub subcontractors sure. who sure. come from all kinds of countries and they might might have been there they might have been doing all kinds of things we're not going to learn more about this for a while no. but certainly no. you have to be familiar with the way the british media works to to realize what big news this was and as i said I, it really I, has unsettled people well, here well is, is, yeah, is that the action is that the action guys of of a side that's losing that's a set that's that, that is that the action of a side that's in disarray that's disorganized no, what no. uh what the russian military did in uh in that uh training facility i mean i look at that and no. that is not the action of uh, of a military that has uh felt like it's lost this war I, I think no. it's the exact opposite. Yeah. 
it, it, it sounds to me like the actions of a military that can decide, oh, well, you guys are trying to slip weapons here in Poland. OK, look at what I do and just moves a rook hard across the table and just slams it on the table and, and says, what are you going to about, do about them apples? You know, I mean, th that was the, the feeling I got and, and a clear indication that there's no place in Ukraine where uh, NATO weapons or potentially personnel can be hidden from them. And I, I think that that might have been it, that, that, that notion that, you know, these guys can really, yeah. So, I mean, th that's the vibe I get. And, uh, but I'm really curious, Alexander, about the, the if, if you don't mind my asking, what was it, what's the vibe? I mean, I, I don't want to, I want to invite you to speculate a little bit as to, you know, or, or, or sort of like expand a little bit on the vibe, on the feeling that you are perceiving from these newspaper accounts. Because I, I agree with you many times, these new pa newspaper accounts, uh, when something is expected, they're just like, this was expected. But I want to know what the tinge of the surprise was. Was it shock? Was it just complete surprise? Was it dismay as if some operation that was ongoing was suddenly collapsed? Uh, please. Uh, shock, dismay, astonishment that it should have happened there, all of which, as I said, begs important questions and does mm. make one wonder why they assumed that this particular location would not be attacked. That is one. I think the other thing that has caused a shock, and you know, bear in mind, we've had a huge amount of information in inverted commas here about the way in which yeah. the Russians conduct this war. Um, the, uh, the other great shock was the precision of this attack. These are very, yeah. very long range missiles launched from enormous distances. We don't obviously know how great the distances were, but they hit exactly on target. And yeah. that isn't something, as I said, which um, makes people here in London very comfortable because it does mm. show, firstly, ab you're absolutely right, it shows that the Russians know exactly what's going on in this place, know exactly what to hit, and they can hit it, and they can hit it directly on the place that it needs to be hit at. So, mm. as I said, th this, was, this was perhaps the single military event that has created the biggest dismay. And it was very interesting that um, when you looked at the media in Britain, the actual officials, government ministers, people like that, were completely silent about it. <laughs> that, you know, you don't have anything from Johnson, from yeah. Liz Trust, from Ben Wallace, from any, anybody like that actually specifically addressing what actually happened in this incident. You you got instead all the usual commentators, analysts, yeah. inverted yeah. commas, analysts. You got people like that talking about it. So official silence, big headlines, dismay, playing yeah, up of the warnings from the US that, you know, if there's an attack on uh, an inch of NATO territory, there will be a massive response. Well, of yeah. course, this isn't yeah. what was what happened. And yeah. as I said, it, it, it does suggest something very big happened and big in ways that, you know, we don't fully understand. Because I'm wondering if the Russians decided to make this move as, as, as basically just booping NATO on the nose and saying, yeah. stay out of here, you know, yeah. kind of like when you, when you boop the nose of a dog with a rolled up newspaper, just to teach them a lesson. And they're so like, oh, yeah. okay, we're not really going to mess with you. We'll talk a lot, but we're not really going to mess with you. I mean, from the point of view of the Russians, they want to scare NATO enough yeah. that NATO decides, no, we don't want to mess with these guys. Yeah. So, yeah. But, yeah, let, let's let's move on to the Chinese issue, which I think is yeah. really fascinating. Yeah. 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 Chinese. Go, go ahead, Godalo. China, Jake Sullivan's comments. Uh, oh, yeah. <coughs> military um, aid. You know, uh, Putin's asking for military aid from China. What, well, what do you make of it? once again... Yeah, one, uh, okay, first of all, that, that notion that Russia has to ask China for military aid, it's laughable. I mean, it's just laughable, okay? Because first of all, the Russians are armed. They've got plenty of gear of their own. I mean, if they ever asked the Chinese, it would be like, you know, spare parts or something, you know, trivial like that. Not, not like a real, like, oh, we need uh, a couple of divisions or we need like a you know, squadron of aircraft. No, it would be trivial if, if, if. The, big, the enormous if they would even bother to ask because the Russians are prepared. They've got gear. So that, I think, was just an outright lie formulated by the West to 
again, give this illusion that Russia is on the back foot in this war, mm. which, again, is absurd. Um, I think that Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor of the United States, <laughs> is trying to, he's trying to play 4D chess, but you yeah. know, he's only got a 1D mind, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, because he's trying to, uh, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, wrist wrestle the Chinese into yeah. backing the American position and yeah. the Chinese aren't having none of it yeah. because the Chinese have made up their mind years ago and one could venture perhaps decades ago that Russia is their future. Mm. And so they have no interest, interest or intention whatsoever on turning their back on that relationship, which the Chinese have invested so much time and effort in. It doesn't make any sense. And, uh, and the notion that they're going to, uh, uh, the Chinese are not liking this whole thing that Chinese firms are going to be punished if they mm. continue to do business with Russia. And that could be the cleavage point. And I think that uh, Jake Sullivan is trying to push that, trying to get yeah. China on side and he has this bizarre illusion as so many people in foggy bottom seem to have that they can see daylight between china and russia there mm. is no daylight between those mm. those two countries there hasn't been in years and so any notion that you can cleave those two together stick a wedge between them and somehow pry them apart is laughable when yeah. when push comes to shove the chinese are going to go with the russians every time uh, uh, gonzalo you said it perfectly i mean i've got little to add just a few things First of all, if we're talking about spare parts and things of that kind, the Chinese military, uh, it, its equipment is completely different from the Russian. I mean, the day when, yeah. you know, the uh, Chinese military used old Soviet equipment, I mean, that's, uh, you know, gone. 40, yeah. 50 years ago. I mean, it just doesn't yeah, apply gone. anymore. And the yeah. kind of equipment we're talking about, the Russians themselves don't use anymore. So, I mean, there's yeah. no conceivable way in which, you know, the Russians could borrow weapons yeah. from the Chinese and use oh. them against the uh, 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 against the, um, <laughs> the Ukraine, Ukrainians. Yeah. And I mean, th th there just isn't that degree of inter interoperability. They're completely yes. different military forces. Maybe in future things will change. But at the moment, they are. That just isn't the case at all. Secondly, um, um, Sullivan is due to meet uh, Yang Chiechi, who is Xi Jinping's uh, um, chief political uh, foreign policy um, advisor in Rome in a few days. The Chinese have just confirmed this, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. And this is, I think, exactly what um, Gonzalo was saying. It's an attempt to try to create some kind of wedge between the Chinese and the Russians to have, you know, the Chinese come out and say, well, no, 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 we're not providing any kind of help to the uh, Russians and create difficulties between these two countries. This is absolutely stupid. I mean, it's mm. it's adolescent diplomacy yeah. because, of course, the <laughs> Russians and the Chinese are in constant contact. Um, I just was looking just a few minutes ago before we started this program on the on to i was looking at the chinese foreign ministry website and sure enough i see that for example a chinese uh, diplomat a senior diplomat just spoke with another senior russian diplomat they were talking about the iran deal all kinds of things like that the the russians and the chinese are in constant communication and um, there is no conceivable way in which the us is going to be able to play the Chinese off against the Russians or get the Chinese to exercise restraints against the Russians. Now, as for this idea of the US imposing sanctions on Chinese companies that you know deal with Russia, I'm going to say two things. If this is done on, an on any extensive scale, then of course we are looking at an economic crisis in the West that, you yeah. know, just doesn't bear contemplation. I mean, we're already looking at a crisis because of the way in which the oil prices have spiked and all kinds of things have been happening on that front. But if you start disrupting Chinese supply chains at this particular moment in that kind of way, well, I mean, you know, it, 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 I mean, we're not looking at 20 percent inflation. We're looking at 40 percent inflation. No, it's I mean, I'm just for the West. Plucking Crimes figures the... out of the sky. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, no. it, it is a ludicrous bluff. The second is that having been to China, I don't think people like Sullivan understand the sheer mass of this economy. Mm. There will always be businesses in China which do all kinds of things 
cover every kind of activity that you can think of, but are not focused on the West. And mm. sanctions aren't going to affect them. So yeah. you'll always find some people who will provide, you know, the textiles, the clothes, the all the kind of things that, you know, are, are, are the paint. I saw that there was an attempt to stop uh, a, a Dutch company providing paint to the Russians. It's always <laughs> going to be some companies in China that will do that. Sure. And with Russian banks now increasingly operating within the RMB, the you know, Chinese currency system, something which must clearly have been organized in, in advance. Yeah. That's actually going to be profitable to many yes. Chinese companies. And at the end of the day, they don't, because they don't trade with the West, it's not going to be an issue for them. Yeah. Uh, we have this idea that, you know, China is just one giant export machine, just as we think of Russia as one giant, Gas station. Gas station. <laughs> and and hateful that phrase. Is, hateful yeah, phrase. I know it is an awful phrase. And again, it's an uh, I mean that might have been true in 1996, but it simply isn't the case anymore. It, mm. it, it's based on an obsolete way of thinking. Well, I've really yeah, and I would now. also I, I, no, I'm go. sorry, I, I just want to no, add no, go, go. something too. That you, the Chinese and Russian cooperation is so extensive that they have gone on joint patrols in in in, uh, in East Asia, uh, let alone joint military exercises. But I, I've always thought that the joint patrols were actually more important because that's more quotidian. That's more like a day to day kind of rubbing of shoulders between Russian officer corps and Chinese officer corps. And so I have no doubt in my mind that the Chinese are the best appraised people on the face of the planet insofar as actual Russian advances in this current conflict. I, I have no doubt in my mind that the Russians are making it a point to give the Chinese a clear picture militarily, warts and all, including their failures, uh, precisely so as to build more trust with the Chinese, because that's been the consistent strategy of, of uh, uh, Putin and, and his, 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 uh, his group, that they, they identify certain relationships or certain communications uh, channels that they are meticulous in being very honest and forthright. Uh, for instance, like the current conflict, we have the Ministry of Defense uh, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that consistently tell people what's going on. They don't try to, uh, uh, you know, they don't invent the ghost of Kiev or the 13 martyrs of Snake Island or any nonsense like this, which later turns out to be PR nonsense, right? And that kind of consistent building of credibility is very valuable at key moments. The Chinese must be perfectly aware of how things are going militarily. And that, of course, by knowing such granular detail, it will make the Chinese even harder to split apart from the Russians because the Chinese know exactly how the Russians are doing. And so it, there's no uncertainty because, you know, uh, um, lack of trust comes from uncertainty. But if you know exactly how your partner is doing in some conflict or some other situation peripheral to your relationship with him, then that trust becomes stronger. And this is human nature. And so I, I think that this whole Jake Sullivan play of trying to split China from the, the, the Russians is ludicrous. I think that, of course, the notion of actually sanctioning China is just stupid. I mean, even even floating the idea is just dumb because it hurts your economy, it scares people. And I think we are seeing this with India, with India being threatened by sanctions for doing business with the Russians. And now this was announced, I, I do believe today, the Indians and the Russians are working out a mechanism to for the Indians to buy Russian oil in rupees, they're looking. They're working out a mechanism to you for a rupee ruble exchange rate, and they're going to tie it in somehow with the renminbi, the the currency of, of China. They, apparently, they want to use the renminbi as a as a standard, um, potentially ushering in uh, ushering the day that the renminbi might become the global reserve currency or another one of the global reserve currencies. But that's for a different conversation. The fact that the Indians and the Russians are doing this. And what's interesting is that the Russians are going to sell oil at a discount to the Indians. It's basically signaling, hey, if you are uh, you know, on our enemies list, no oil for you, no food for you, and no fertilizer for you, which is a big deal because Belarus